Well, today we have a little bit different. I'll be reading from a, a full passage from the Futahat, from Ibn Arabi. And this passage will be, he has a series of hadith that he looks at in his chapter on Hajj, on the pilgrimage. And we'll look at the 16th hadith that he looks at. And it's so interesting. I've always loved this passage. It just goes in and out um, and brings up so many ideas and emotions. And so we'll, we'll look at this one by, I'll have the slides will help help everyone follow by having key words or key sentences. Um, but generally, I'll have to be reading and hope that I can read in a way that is understandable to everyone. So I'll start reading. And uh, so you'll see the Ein is the puppet, the Ein. And it's feminine in Arabic. So we'll say she for the for the Ein. And this is the Huck looks at the mirror and you are the reflection or the image or the light source shines on the puppet and then the shadow play the image begins so ibn arabi is going to be looking at the hadith that there is nothing forbidden the woman to cover except her face during the hajj and in ihram so ihram is the entrance of the sacred for the pilgrimage and so this niqab covering the face is not permitted during the hajj and he's going to look at the entire issue of niqab and, and hijab as well. So after he says, he cites this hadith, he said, this is a return to the root, which is that there is no hijab and no veiling and no covering. <clears throat> the root is an affirmation of the basic ayn. So the ayn is, the, is that puppet, the skeleton, we all have an ein, but it's feminine in Arabic, so he'll be using he and she, uh, she for, the, for this. By her receptivity, by the, the ein, the receptivity to hear the address B, that's the kun fayakun, when she is addressed, she becomes a nominal qualified by an adjective. So the ein is a nominal, it's a thing, and then it gets its uh, address to B, and it becomes something descriptive, an adjective. She was ready to receive the description of becoming into being. Now she rushes towards a vision of the object of her devotion. When he says to her in the state of her empty void, be, she becomes. She becomes separate by herself and yet not separate. She was found and made to become without any restriction upon her in the image of her maujid, of her finder, of her creator humbled by the majesty of her object of vision, not perceiving or recognizing any veiling hijab. The word for jealousy in Arabic is gheirat, and it comes from the word gheir, the other. So, and gheirat also has the concept of protective jealousy. That is, your, uh, in, the, in the lexicon, um, the woman will be protectively jealous of her child. But of course, it also includes the jealousy of, of, of like sexual tension jealousy as well. So we'll get into all of these. But protective vigilance comes from seeing another, a rare, another, who is like you, a rival of yours competing for what you want to acquire. Or perhaps something has been acquired by you, which the other one wants to grab as his. God has created human beings with vehement desires and greediness. So you think that everything should be yours and under your control in order to bring out the decisive quality of the image which you were flush against. Part of your truth is that everything should be under your dominion because you were made flesh against his image. So because we are made flesh against the image of the divine, that we will see divine names on this side of the mirror or this side of the shadow play. And although those divine names will be, as you can see, fuzzy, blurry, or incomplete, or uh, perhaps transposed or other kinds of strange things happening to them, nevertheless, at the base, they are divine names, which are then manifesting on this side of the shadow play.
So Ibn Arabi writes, God has permitted his female creatures to go to the mosques. But one of the people thinks that the Prophet wasallam, if he had seen what the women had recently started doing after him, he would have forbidden the women from going to the mosque, just as the women of the tribe of Israel were forbidden. They think that God does not know that this kind of thing could occur among his creatures, yet it is he who is the maker of law, no one else. They prefer their opinion to the rule of God. For example, a man who was strong in practicing his faith was jealous and overly protective of his wife when she was going out to the mosque. The woman, who was beautiful indeed, loved to go to the mosque for the prayer. The hadith reporting that it is forbidden to prevent women from going to the mosque stopped him from preventing her, but he was intensely distressed. So his internal dialogue is, if only I could have God take back the decision for this issue. He preferred his own viewpoint of stopping women from going to the mosques over the decision of God. The may happen is like the actually happens, and he kept making sly insinuations to her until she stopped herself from going to the mosque. He was delighted with that. But if in this man the dominion of the intellect were strengthened, he would not have been jealous. And if strengthened in him had been the dominion of faith, he would not have found a burden on his heart, and he would have contented himself with what God had ruled. He exalted said, but know by your Lord they are not faithful ones, until they make you the judge deciding the disputes between them. Then they will not find in their souls any burden concerning what you decided, and they would concede fully. Okay. I think we're, timing is going to be good. <laughs> so this is the, the maqam of Abraham, the station of Abraham. We have given this report concerning women going to the mosque in this discussion because we are concerned here with the issue of the women during the pilgrimage, that she does not cover her faith during ihram. It is jealousy that pr produces the rule that she should cover. It is confirmed that in the Sahih that there is none more jealous than God. Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, says about Sa'ad, Sa'ad is jealous, and I am more jealous than Sa'ad, and God is more jealous than me. And part of his jealousy is making offensive behaviors unlawful. No one exceeds the jealousy of God, but this other person is in himself and with regard to himself more jealous than God. Indeed, the matter of going to the mosque is, according to God, not an offensive behavior, because if it were offensive, according to God, he would have made it unlawful. God makes unlawful the offensive behaviors, the visible ones, and the invisible ones. The rule is universal. Thus, this person has deemed something offensive that is not offensive, according to God, and he has called what God said a lie, and he deems himself, because of his jealousy, to be a better judge than God in setting up this ruling. Anyone who thinks this way will never stop being tormented inside. How fine is his statement? from the slide before, then they will find, they will not find in themselves any burden concerning what you decided, and they would concede faithfully, fully. So here at the, at the station of, of Abraham, so Ibn Arabi says, if the human being will examine his soul and place her, his soul, in this scale, he will see his soul to be an ungrateful disbeliever, far from truth and far from faith. You see, God has denied that someone like this is faithful, and he swore on himself that this one is not a faithful one. And that's the divine oath. No, by your Lord, they are not faithful ones. So the divine oath. If her being covered up was at root, it would not have been said to her for ihram, do not cover your face, because that would go against the root. Do you see that the verse of hijab was not brought down from the beginning? Yes, it was brought down by one of the created beings calling for it, this verse and others. And elsewhere, Ibn Arabi talks about who brings these verses down and what these three verses are. Uh, we can look at the, from the Musnad Aisha, from the thousands of Aisha hadith, we have this one. Aisha said, Omar bin al-Khattab was saying to the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, veil your women. 
she said, but he did not do it. And the wives of Messenger of God, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, were going out at night to the privies to go to the bathroom. Salda, daughter of Zama, went out, and she is a tall woman. So Omar saw her while he was in the mosque. He said, I recognize you, Salda, eager that the hijab come down. She said, so God sent down the hijab. So this is why Ibn Arabi says, do you see that the verse of hijab was not brought down from the beginning? No, it was brought down by one of the created beings calling for it, this verse and others. And other verses are the ones down below. Two other promptings were, Omar said, I wish we would take the station of Abraham for prayers. And the verse came, take the station of Abraham for a praying place. Third, after his lecture to the wives, Hafsa and Aisha, the verse came, it may be that his Lord, if he divorced you all, would give him wives better than you. So these are prompted verses, and prompted by statements that Omar made. So Ibn Arabi then continues, uh, he, uh, assuming that we, we know this already, because he talks about it elsewhere. And then he says, and many of the rulings of the law were sent down for worldly reasons. Otherwise, God would not have sent them down. Therefore, the family of God differentiate between the divine ruling that comes from the beginning and the divine ruling that comes after it had been demanded on behalf of the creatures of God. The demand being the motivating reason for that ruling. It is as if the true were tasked to send it down since if not for the demand, he would not have sent that ruling down. This is different from his sending something down from the beginning. Thus, if you are one to verify yourself, you will take the divine ruling sent down from the beginning differently from a divine ruling not sent down from the beginning. But do not be alarmed, my journeying friend, by the fact that the true haq sent down things at the behest of petitioners, rush forward to accept his rule, whatever kind it may be, that is an original one or a prompted one, with expanded chest, with pure soul, if you want to be faithful. As for people with abundant intelligence, let them rely on and be at ease with God, and the divine rule will be at ease with them. Messenger of God, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, used to say, leave off of me what I leave off of you, such as what I said about the pilgrimage being obligatory each year. So he was questioned over and over, uh, should we do the Hajj every year? So he said, if I had said yes, it would have been obligatory, but it is only a single pil pilgrimage. He disliked the questioning and found fault with it because such questions, should we do this, should we do that, would add to the number of things tasks. So may God give me and you understanding of the intents of the law and not let what is apparent veil us from what is invisible. And it's neat to watch how Ibn Arabi uses the idea of veiling <clears throat> throughout this. The veiled ones, of course, the people can't see, the veiled ones, the women, the veiling of trying to see what really is happening in a situation. Okay, let me just, yeah, good. So this is about the Hajj now. So this is all one, so he puts all of these things together in one, one passage about the 16th Hadith. So he says, the worship ritual of the Hajj is a similitude for the people of their conditions on the day of arising for judgment disheveled, dusty, imploring, running with necks craned to the collar, abandoning adornment, throwing stones, uh, jamrat, wrapped up in apparently insane preoccupations. They are in a worship ritual. If they knew what was in her, they would be baffled. They are like madmen throwing rocks. God made her a warning for them in throwing the pebbles that the place of the vision on the day of arising for judgment is great indeed, carrying off intellects. There is no worship which is more a pure worship in all her rituals than the Hajj. In this way, the women will be in the hereafter, abode during the arising for judgment with uncovered faces, just as they are during the state of Ihram, when they're in the sacred state of the pilgrimage. 
If the demands concerning the hijab based on personal preference had not by chance gotten attached to the law, the verse of hijab would have not been sent down. In fact, God did not hold back this, vo this verse, waiting for this prompting, this verse and others, with rulings that are suspended, waiting for something like this, except in order to accumulate a hoard, like a hoard of pebbles to be thrown, to be used as the final reckoning against the individual who caused people to be tasked with this hijab. He will surely wish on the day of arising that he was not responsible for that. Yes, it will be hard on him, but about this, the people remain heedless. It is that way also for the people of Ijtihad, the people who make independent judgments on the day of arising. There are two kinds. The first makes forbidding dominant, and the second makes lifting the burden from the mother community dominant. So the first people are people who look at a law and try to make a, give a fatwa or give a, a what someone should do in a legal situation, and they make forbidding dominant. So they make it difficult. They make, don't do this, don't do that. And the other one, going to the roots of the verses, tries to make a fatwa or a ruling which is easy for people and is easy to do. Such a person, the, the slatter, such a person, according to God, is closer to God and has a greater rank than the one who makes forbidding dominant. As the forbidden is, uh, is an accidental matter, which happens to the root. So if you go back to the root, you'll find openness and ease. If you go into the, the branches, you might then begin to find difficulties. And such a person lifts off the burden with the root and back to the root, the condition of the people return in the gardens with their settling down in the garden wherever they like. So to, be, to make a ruling about a legal issue, go back to the root because you'll find ease and lack of restrictions and you'll find something that is not forbidden, easy to do. But in the same way, you go back to the root of the men and women, how were, were, were we in the root of the situation? We were without hijab. So how heedless are the people of destruction, destructive attachments, even if they are faithful ones, even if they are mu'minin, about this issue, but they will be sorry. Being is a single abode, and the cherisher of the abode is one, and the people are the dependent family of God, with him accompanying them all in this abode. So where is the hijab? Does anyone other than God see? Is anyone other than God seen? Is the thing veiled from its truth? A portion of the whole comes from itself. Eve was created from Adam. Men and women are equal halves. Okay. So I think what I'll, I'll do is I'll read this passage and then we'll have the Allahi if possible coming after that. So how often this happens, how much have I suffered with this subject from the veiled over people when their destructive attachments dominate their intelligence. In other words, their jealousy dominates their intelligence. I would grab their belts to save them from the fire, but they throw themselves in anyway. When Ibn Arabi says this, he's, he's reminding us of the, the say, statement of the Prophet Sallallahu who says, the parable of me and you is this, someone kindles a fire and the grasshoppers and the moths start to fall into the fire. He tries to stop them and protect them. I am the one holding your belts to keep you from falling into the fire, but you keep slipping away. And Ibn Arabi puts, uh, gives us a poem in the middle of this passage on the Hadith number 16. The sickness, the sickness of jealousy is a chronic disease and one God has revealed a cure for. That cure is the one we just heard. Men and women are equal halves. Whoever uses it recovers, and whoever diverges it stays perverted. The least of the matter for him is that he be seen and he be described with confessing his failure. Let me just see what I have to do this. So um, if Baki is ready, this is a Good time for us to have the ilahi. Alhamdulillah. 
Thank you, thank you. So Ibn Arabi then tells us another story, or gives us another example. One of the companions of the Prophet invited the Prophet to dinner. The Prophet wasallam, said to him, I and this one, pointing to Aisha. The man said no. So he refused his invitation until the man acknowledged that she should come with him. Then the two went to be guests at the house of that man, the Prophet ﷺ, and Aisha anha. And God says, you have in messenger of God a fine exemplar. Where is your faith if you would see today a person of elevated rank, like a judge or a lecturer or a vizier or a sultan doing something like this, following the model of the Prophet? Would you not describe him as having inferior character? But if this quality were not one of the praiseworthy virtues, messenger of God would not have done it. He who was sent to perfectly complete the praiseworthy behaviors. While messenger of God was lecturing on the day of gathering on Friday, the Juma, on the minbar, he saw his grandchildren, Hassan and Hussein, approaching, tripping over their clothes. So he could not help descend from the minbar and pick them up both and bring them up to the minbar. And only then did he return to his lecture. Now, do you see that as a deficiency in his state? No, by God, no. This comes from perfect completeness of his marifa, of his recognition. He sees by which eye he looks and for whom he looks, something hidden from the blind who do not see. They are the ones who say, wasn't he distracted from God by this kind of thing? But he, by God, was not focused on anything but God. And here he'll, he's going to cite someone that you probably will recognize as being Rabia, but because he's criticizing her right now, he doesn't mention her name or give us any clue that, of who she is. Later in the Futaha or in other places of the Futaha, he mentions Rabia by name and praises her very, very highly. But uh, as is, we saw in a few slides ago, you do not mention someone's name when you're being critical. And yet it's important sometimes to say something that they've done, uh, but the name is not mentioned. Only when you're saying things that are good and beautiful and helpful to that person, then you say their name. So it is as the one who said, who does not know, oh, that she be made safe. When she heard the reciter of the Quran recite, indeed the companions of the gardens on that day occupied with delights. When she heard that recited, she said, those poor ones, people of the garden, in their being occupied with delights and their wives. Oh, you are the poor one. He spoke of the real focus, exalted as he beyond these. You are not recognizing in whom and by whom they are delighted, they and their wives. So why do you judge them, saying that they are distracted from God? 
If this antagonist were focused on God, she would not have made this statement. She has testified against herself that she was with other than God in her misconception. This is one of the hidden ruses that God uses to trick the Arafin. By disparaging another based on the first thing that comes to mind and intim intimating that they are all immune to that. So disparaging another based on the first thing that comes to mind and intimating that they are all immune to all of that. People of jealousy are like that all the time, always in jealousy's incessant torment, worn out with thinking, thinking, and in regard to God, remote and far removed without realizing it. So to back, and then Ibn Arabi ends the passage there. But uh, I think we need to find out more about what, why the people in the garden with their delights and their busy focuses uh, and their rejoicing, why are they, or how are they re doing something in whom and by whom they are delighted? So how, how is this divine? How is this focused on the divine? And so Ibn Arabi elsewhere, uh, not too far away, chapter 60, says, the creative acts return in the garden, so being able to create things, returns in the garden, provided by the configuration of the other world, where one may say, be and it is. The rule is forever for the receivers of command, because the movement is one, while her effects are different depending on the receivers. The reason the movement is one is so that none of the creation will be alone and independent in acting or in commanding without a partner. So Ibn Arabi is saying here that what they are doing in the garden uh, is not frivolity or uh, something to be disparaged. They are doing the divine work of creation. And this divine creation for us in the garden is with partners. And Ibn Arabi often says that uh, sex is for reproduction or uh, and or pleasure. And so it's for reproduction and or pleasure. And But in the garden, it's for pleasure because there is no physical reproduction. There is instead this kun fayakun reproduction or, or generation or creation. And this creation takes place in partnership. So partners are creating uh, with kun fayakun all throughout the garden for all of all of these worlds and they are doing that with busy focus but it's not a diverted focus focus they're not forgetting what they are doing they are doing this as divine creators because haq creates solely but the creatures create in the garden with kun fayakun in partnership And uh, if, if Hamida Noor is ready, we've got uh, the Elahi number 35, and I think she'll do the last two uh, paragraphs or stanzas. <laughs> this dervish comes before you. You know all my intentions. O oh, holy Padisha, you alone can calm this fever. Please make my conscience clear, Amanahala. This dervish plunges into your sea of light, cleansing my whole being. This dervish plunges into your sea of light. No darkness can remain. This dervish comes before you. You are sheer forgiveness. Yagafar, Yagafur. You alone can make this mind pure. Please lift me into your truth. Amanahala. This dervish cries out, Estafirullah. And my delusion disappears like 
darkness. This dervish cries out, Astaghfirullah, only your love remains. Thank you. So in order to prepare creatures, to prepare us for creating with be and it is, um, so much has to happen before that. So much of our natural disposition to be jealous, possessive, greedy, all of that has to somehow uh, be fixed or uh, changed so that we can be in a position of saying, kun, be, and it is. And Ibn Arabi tells us that the Prophet وسلم, only once used kun fayakun in this world. And that was when a figure was coming to them and people were nervous that this could be an enemy coming to them. And so while everyone was uh, scared of this person, of this figure coming, uh, the Prophet وسلم, said, Kun Abadar, so be Abu Dhar, and it was Abu Dhar. So that was the creation of Abu Dhar be, uh, on the call of the Prophet. And so we can then see how much work has to be done before we can be in gardens and saying be and it is. So we have good amount of time now for some discussion inshallah so okay let's see how this raised hand works and i'll be relying on mustafa to help me if i miss things <laughs> okay so and mustafa said that the raised hand will come up okay here we've got one raised hand uh yeah uh, Alex H, iPad Pro. <laughs> Bismillah. You'll, you'll, need, you'll need to unmute. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum, Professor Shoy and classmates. Um, I, I've been lucky enough to join your Zoom classes from the, from the beginning, from the first class. Uh, thanks to you and thanks to Mustafa Fardad for informing us. Unfortunately, the last few classes, because of my job, I was not able to attend. So I'm not sure if uh, there are two subjects that are dear to my heart. I'm not sure if they were covered in the last few classes that I wasn't here. And if possible, you may give them some attention in the future. One of them is, uh, Mumin is the mirror of the Mumin. I'm not sure if you covered it in the past couple of weeks or if you will cover it in the future. The other one is with all the things happening around us these days, all the disasters, all the wars and fires and uh, tsunamis and so forth, uh, the subject of Mahdi, the promised one, if you have covered it in the past couple of weeks or if you are planning to give that some attention. Now, these are two comments, and I had a question about today's lecture, if I may. Uh, my question is regarding the issue of hijab. Uh, I have a, I, ha I myself have a 18-year-old uh, daughter. Uh, uh, so uh, the issue of hijab is kind of important. Uh, in Surah, and, and, and I'm not asking you for a fatwa here uh, in this class. I'm just asking for Ibn Arabi's point of view and perspective and explanations. In Surah Ahzab, uh, 33, third Surah, Ayah 59, it says, Ya ayyuhan nabiyyo, qul la azwajika wa banatika wa nisa'il mu'minina yudnina ala hinna min jalabi bihin. Tell, you know the meaning, tell your wife and uh, the wife and daughters and wives of the believers, you know, to use their uh, covering. Also in Surah Nur, uh, Ayah 31, it says in English, uh, tell the women to use their scarf or uh, covering to cover their chests. So all these 
at, at least the ones I've come across, ayahs in Quran regarding hijab are talking about the chest, the, the breast, the neck, the body. I, I haven't come across the hair, specifically the hair being covered. Now, especially for those of us who live in the West, you know, um, what is Ibn Arabi's interpretation of these ayahs on hijab? Is it specifically mentioned the hair to be covered? Uh, well, the way, he, the way he works with those verses and works with these ideas, because uh, we also have ideas about that the slave woman is not allowed to cover her head with uh, anything. Um, and so what Ibn Arabi is telling us is that because there are these situations when you cover, that tells you that the covering is not original that the covering is, is not original, it's not basic. Um, it's covering for different situations, which isn't the same thing as saying the woman is, is, is to be veiled. Um, so he, he looks at that. He also, in the sense of aura, of the private parts, he'll say that uh, the aura is, can only be what Adam and Eve covered. So whatever Eve, Adam and Eve covered uh, the, with, the, with the fig leaf, that is the aura. Everything else that's covered, could be covered by Sharia, that is, there's a law that came later, but you can't say that what's covered, except for the private, the two private parts, is the aura. And so Ibn Arabi is having us see that the Sharia comes in culturally, uh, in cultural con contexts. But to say that if I cover, if I cover as a, as, a, as a man, I cover my thighs, for instance. That's not because the thighs are aura. It's because of the Sharia saying that I should wear something that covers a certain amount and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu who covered his thighs. And so he makes the, the point about, look at what's an original ruling and what is a contextual ruling. And a contextual ruling prompted by a situation that someone calls for. So. Thank you. Yeah, no, we won't be giving a, a fatah. That, that's one of the most interestingly in, intricate and complicated questions. Uh, we have another. Uh, um, yes, I think it's, is that Sheikh Afaria with a uh, raised hand? Alhamdulillah. Salam Good, alaykum. yes. Good. Everyone, companions. Um, it, uh, somewhat on the same subject, but in a more general way, because um, you say, so the root is, is open, alhamdulillah, and yet the branches have restrictions. So, um, yes, how one navigates that, and, um, you know, is, I guess, the question. And there are probably many rulings, and today we are seeing more rulings on many issues, and, um, is it so that Ibn Arabi said, uh, choose the easier ruling for you? Is that, um, is that true? I mean, you, you mentioned that the ones who promote ease are, are closer or will be closer to Allah. Um, in other words, less restrictions, less burden. Um, and yet we know that restrictions are also important in that first part of the path to tame our our limited self to tame our ego. So, uh, is is it completely an individual? In other words, really, where the servant is on the path. I mean, I'm not saying with main things, but with things like covering, um, is is a good one. It seems to be such a disputed issue. What 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 do you feel, Shwey? So, so one of them is it, it's telling us what I'm uh, gathering from all of this is that there is a, um, there is a culture of Islam and, and so that culture came about by promptings. So it's not the original and so that other, other communities will not have that because they are on other, they are on the basics and they have put their own uh, additional things on after that. So it's, so we do things uh, knowing that some of the things we do are basic and some of the things we do are, are contextual, that came in historical, that came in time. 
and they became they came because of a prompting that someone prompted this to happen. Mm-hmm. But then when we're doing ijtihad, independent judgment, whenever we're having a situation, we return to the root. So we always do have to return to the root. What is the root of mm-hmm. of the hijab? What is the root of of the of other uh, mm-hmm. rituals or or behaviors? Mm-hmm. And this returning to the root is is absolutely crucial because we cannot take a branch um, mm-hmm. and then have a completely new situation and have that branch be effective. Uh, we need to be having the root. So we go back to the root. Um, and the root is protection. Let's say if we take the root of hijab as protection, um, and, and so when the tall woman was walking outside to go to the bathroom, now can you see there's no indoor plumbing. So this is, a, this is already something that most of us are not involved in. Um, so this tall woman, Salda, going out and then Omar seeing her and say, I see you. Now, the idea uh, here was to protect women at night uh, by identifying who they were. Because it wasn't thought that you could that women could be protected without saying they belong to a particular community, mm-hmm. which means that if we have a community that can protect women without having to say I'm Muslim, then that would be something. But return to the root of protection. If being a Muslim visibly is something dangerous, then the hijab would not be would be would be forbidden. Um, because it would it would be putting you in danger, so that 's why this topic is so interesting it and it requires such a knowledge of the of the root, which is protection and goodness, mm-hmm. and then to then say, what is the way to protect myself and to be good in in the in the in this way in this situation and then the hijab also with those the verses from the Quran, you know when you are before a man who has no sexual desire for you, then there is no hijab you don 't cover um, and so you now have this situation of men who are not interested in you sexually being ones that you can you can speak, and all the commentators talk about this who the, who this this tabi'in, who these people were who uh, did not have sexual desire for women and how they interacted with uh, women in a certain way. So then it becomes the situation of what is the route to protect and then how do you protect in your situation? And so instead of taking a branch and trying to mangle it over to here, we go back to the root and then come up wherever we come up. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Um, the other situation is also Salat. And I did come across, uh, I'm not sure where, uh, as, you know, a phrase of, of Ibn Arabi that said, um, you cover in Salat because of, you know, humbling yourself before your Lord. So cover the head because the head is the place of arrogance and, and two-ness. So what, um, yeah, just maybe your word on, on that. Um, I mean, he said, it, it's obviously, I don't think it felt like one of the greater uh, aberrations, let's say, to not cover during Salat, it, but it, it is, again, I mean, we are accountable for everything <laughs> and every breath, I, I think. And so if we have the means, is it better to cover our head for Salat or it doesn't matter so much? I don't know. What do you feel from his own teachings? Bismillah. So, yeah, the, the covering the head is, is for humility. And so the idea is that the free woman uh, is very proud and uh, she is free. She goes where she wants, uh, unlike what we assume, uh, but that, that the free woman then is, is, has pride and can go wherever she wants and has independence. So therefore, in the salat, she covers the head. And then, uh, and so the slave woman doesn't, is not allowed to cover her head uh, in a sense, because the slave woman already has plenty of humility, has no need or anyone else to say, to push her down. Mm-hmm. So the hijab then is is just the way for the, the, the men's head covering. It's a way for those who are feeling prideful uh, mm-hmm. to become, to, to physically uh, have a feeling to remind us in the, in the intimate conversation with the divine that we are, that we are to be humble. And so, again, this would be the, the fiqh or the legal interpretation would all based on your hal, on your own state. So if I am, if I am, if I am a slave woman 
battered and humiliated all the time. Of course, when I enter the divine conversation, I need no reminder of that. In fact, I need to change that. Um, but if I am a, you know, the free Arab woman of that time, who was very proud and independent, and as we know from reading between the lines, um, they argued with anyone they wanted to, their husbands and so on, and Aisha argued with her husband, her father, all of these things. Uh, so that person then says, my hal is very strong and very independent, so I cover my head uh, for humility during the intimate conversation. And men too. No, right, and then men too, right. Thank you. Uh, one other question. I'm sorry. Uh, may I say, also, is when you said that he said, though, run toward what Allah has commanded, no matter whether it comes from, you know, someone's uh, desire, in, in the case of Hazrat Omar, uh, or whether it comes from an original divine uh, ruling. And so that would seem to, you know, in a sense, remove uh, flexibility. What do you think? Uh, because then if you run toward all of those, um, yeah, what do you say about that? Well, so, so the first one would be when I have a behavior that comes and, and I can see that this is a historical, uh, you know, Muslim historical Arab uh, uh, behavior, then, and yet if it's in the Sharia, then I accept that even though I say, oh, I know this is a historical Arabic uh, yeah. this century situation. Yeah. Right. But when I'm going, when I'm trying to draw from what I should do in my behavior, then I go. Then I need to go to the root if there's any if there's any difficulty. So if this cultural situation has caused problems, then I have to go to the root. For instance, uh, we all know that the nice, beautiful beard is a is a, a beautiful sunnah. But there are many people in in the in the in the world who don't grow these beautiful beards. And so, what is their situation? Obviously, the beard can't be considered a root issue. Yeah. It's a it's a historical uh, because our Prophet Sallallahu had a beautiful beard, and so that's why we want to emulate him if we can. And if we can't, then we do whatever we can by going to the root. Uh, I think Aisha 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 has a, a raised hand. Yes. Thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, I had a question about when you were saying that the hijab is not from the original and things, and I was just wondering whether it was, I don't know, I might be wrong, whether there was a history of it in Judaism and then Christianity. Um, because I know Orthodox Jewish women, there's something about covering of the head. And if we look at traditional images of the Virgin Mary, it's with a head covering and things. And obviously we know that Islam in its official sense came after that. So I'm wondering if you could comment on that and saying it's not an original in terms of the hijab. Um, I was going to talk about the humility thing, but I think it's how you define being a servant of Allah's and being a slave, which could then, I suppose, define whether you decide to wear the hijab. Thank you. Yeah, well, yeah, the, the historical... Uh evolution of the of the hijab for the for the early muslims is 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 very interesting because what partly what happened is that when the arabs got to persia um all of the upper class women were completely veiled and uh, just the way we have in the west um the reason in the west that fair skin was was thought to be high class is because you didn't go out in the field and get and get suntanned and get and get burned and the same way with long fingernails if you have long fingernails you can't do anything so oh that means oh she has long fingernails she must be a woman of of high class and so the same way when the arabs got to interacting with the persians and they saw all their women were veiled and very high class and these arabs women were coming like country bumpkins you know unveiled have very powerful language because we know that they the the women used during the wars the battles would give these poems a very very rude rude poems and so so the so the in order to elevate the status of the arab woman it seems that the ulama the people kind of in charge of the law 
uh, began to say that whatever the wives of the prophet did, let's let's put that on all women to raise their status um, because the, the wives of the prophet had very specific um, extra veils you know the full veil not marrying after and on all of these things so in order to elevate the sort of country bumpkins of the arab women uh, to make them to have the status of the prophet's wives and to be veiled and then to be able to compete as it were in class with the with the the Persians or the or the room or, or whoever it was so certainly uh, those were again uh, why historically uh, Muslims have 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 said that the veil is necessary is very much part of class and so and so to be upper class is to be is to be veiled and to be lower class or slaved is to be refused to allow to be veiled um, We, we have Andrea from Wisconsin or Minnesota? Wisconsin. <laughs> okay, yeah, please go ahead, Andrea. Um, I do have a question because I've worked with the concept of um, hijab and veiling. Um, it may be not within the context that is being spoken here, but uh, that there's a different meaning also to hijab. And I guess you go back to the root of that um, because he talks um, Ibn Arabi throughout the Futuhat of the different veils that veil us from him. And we are in different stations, which are different veils. And so I'm wondering, does that pertain to any uh, one element of this? Or is there, um, will you be going on to speak further about uh, the different veils? He also speaks of 33 different veils that uh, and starting with love, our, our knowledge, and going all the way through where our station, our, our levels with him are. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that would take us very far. Yeah, we, that's at least a few sessions in itself. Uh, the veil starts out with being the body is the veil for for what's inside. So it's veiling what's inside. Uh, there is the proverb that uh, the one who uh, looks at the veil, sees what is behind it. Um, and so this is the concept. Uh, Ibn Arabi has the idea that if you have a figure without any veil, you can't see them. But if they were to veil themselves, uh, suddenly you could see them. And so the veil is the way that we see. So the veil is the way we see the divine. And that veil primarily then is the body, uh, veiling the heart. Yes. And then by, so by looking at the body, which is like looking at the cosmos, then we see the creator behind that veil. Yes, because so. I, I know in the Futuhat he mentions that um, he has, uh, has placed the veil of ourselves over us right. so that we may learn who we are in him. That's, and it is, and that's so beautiful that the way that the thing that you think is keeping you from seeing God is the thing that's allowing you to see God. So it's, it's beautiful yes. the way Penarbi does that. Thank you, Andrea. Beautiful. Shuei, there's, there's several chats, several questions in the chat. Yeah. Uh, can I ask a quick one? Yes, Omar, go ahead while I read these. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, in terms of the prompted verses, the prompted command, uh, and you explained very well that uh, the, the, like Sheikha asked about, about what happens when we have the branches and, 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 and how to distinguish whether you follow the branch and the root. And you explained that if there is an ambiguity, if it's not a sharia, then you can go back into the root and, and understand. That action, is that action done by the individual at an individual level? Or is it within a community, be it the smaller or the wider community with their guide, etc.? that they actually undertake that action to understand if that ambiguous situation is ambiguous indeed, and you do need to go into the roots. So is it done at an individual level or a, or a, or a community level? Yeah, no, that's so interesting. And then Uzair uh, from Cambridge has, 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 is asking a similar question about ijtihad and is that individual or who, who qualifies and so on. Um, so there, there's two ways of looking at it. On the one hand, on, uh, first to argue that it's individual because 
we go back to the root. So when it says, ask the people of Dhikr, if you don't know, then this ask is each individual who's being addressed is then someone who may ask the people of Dhikr if they don't know. And therefore, Ijtihad is anyone who is an individual who must make uh, a decision, an understanding of the law. And so we can't, to put on restrictions and forbidding, like, oh, you have to have this much Quran memorized, you have to be this much a nice person, or you have to be male, or all of these restrictions, those are all these restrictions that add burden after burden. So we go back to the root and say, an individual. On the other hand, on the other hand, what you're talking about with, is the community's wisdom. And the, commu the mother community, the ummah, has wisdom. And the a mother community's wisdom is in mansanata sunata hasana. Whoever does a sunnah, which is beautiful, then, and so on. So doing a sunnah that is beautiful is something that the community can then begin to do. So the community finds out that what's the best way for us to do something, or we have this issue called lockdown or COVID, how can we do a Zoom dhikr? That is a sunnah, which is beautiful, so that this community can say, this is how we'll handle this situation. And the beauty of that handling, the wisdom of that handling it, then passes on, and everyone who does it uh, is involved in its reward. So that's the mansanna sunnata hasana. And it's, it's a beautiful way to, to say that the group has wisdom. So on the one hand, the individual is autonomous, and it's addressed by Quran, by Sharia, by Allah, to figure out the right thing to do at this moment. Um, and then on the other hand, the community has its wisdom. And we rely on the community's wisdom to say, what's a good way of doing something? What's a good sunnah in these new situations? Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I think Ali Rahman has a, a raised hand. I'm, I'm going by the, on my participants. Uh, there's an Aisha. Uh, there's, uh, and then Ali Rahman, perhaps. Um, this is an Aisha Shafta, another, another, Aisha? Hello, yes. Hello, yeah. can you hear me? Okay, now we got you, yeah. Okay, um, I was asking about, or I wanted to ask about the hijab and, um, and, and remembering not to be prideful during Salat. Does that apply also for women when we're out in the world and we're wearing hijab, like, is that a good reason to continue to wear it? Or, or is that a totally separate issue? And, and, and sort of where that leads to for me is um, sometimes obeying and doing the right thing <laughs> makes me more prideful. Like, look at me, I'm so good wearing the scarf. Uh, and is there any, any, any way to approach that um, in the spirit? Thank you. Yeah, well, you know, the, the, whatever we know about the hijab, uh, sort of the physical uh, and, and conventional descriptions are for the salat or for the prayer. So what happens out, outside of the prayer is not quite as clear. And then there are, there are these other kinds of decisions. But again, what it is, what's so beautiful, um, the, the hijab and, the, and let's say the fast of Ramadan, let's look at those both, because those are both situations where um, you know why you're doing them. And so and one of the reasons that the fast is so important and such a teacher for us is that no one knows whether I'm fasting or not, whether I had a sip of water or this or that, uh, but only I know. And so it's very much personal. I know, only I know what I'm doing. And so, um, and the same way with the hijab, am I wearing it because of, of habit and I would feel naked without it, uh, which is, means I'm doing it for ha habit and not necessarily as a divine command that I'm responding to. So it's, it's a very much uh, interesting in that you can see someone with or without, and you have no idea whether which one is doing for the right reasons, as it were. So that's why it's very fascinating. Just like the fast, you can never tell who's fasting and not fasting. And so it really does unleash uh, some wonderful questions that the, that the person who's on the spiritual path will begin to ask all these questions. Yeah. I think we have uh, Ali Rahman is, uh, is here with a raised hand. Ali Rahman, there he is, yeah. Assalamu alaikum, thank you so much. I have a question, I don't know if it's a question, but is there any hijab for the men's for their eyes? 
because there's hijab is uh, having two. One is looking, one is look, uh, seeing. Yes, because as you spoke of Persians in Zarathustra, it was men, it was asked of men to cover their eyes. And then it's like we have the Nazar Bar Qadam, which you keep, we keep our uh, look at our feet. And the other one is that Nazar Bar Rasul, Nazar Bar Khuda, means that we keep at, our gaze at Rasul Allah and, and, and Allah. Then is, it, is there anything from Ibn Arabi for men to keep their own eyes covered? And that's why, because there's so much in Sufis that when you wear somewhere, lower your gaze, don't look at the thing. If you go to somebody's house, don't look at anything without permission. So I feel like putting it on people that being looked at, it's like, but then if you read between the line, it's really taking the responsibility, bringing it here and said, how can I cover my own eyes? I don't mean physically, but inwardly, keeping the gaze at Rasul and Khoda. Yeah, that, that's so beautiful. That's, and that's how Ibn Arabi does it. He, he, you know, the first lower your gaze is to the men. So the men lower their gaze, and then the women are told to lo lower their gaze. So certainly that is, we need to see that root order. Men lower <laughs> your gaze, women lower your gaze. And in the verse about the, the, the wives of the prophet are told to lower, make their voices, um, it's a, it's a technical way of saying unflirtatious. So make, a, make your voice lowered so it doesn't sound inviting. And that's because in the Quran, the verse says, there are sick men there who are listening to that and might get the wrong idea. So there are sick men present. So in order, because there are sick men, we have the prophet's wives told to lower their voices. Now, so that's not at root. So women don't lower their voices unless there's sick men around. And so, so we, should, we should spend at least equal effort of, of having uh, lowered voices trying to get the sick men healed. And so nice. certainly this is the sick men who need to be healed. Um, and the same way with jealousy, uh, he's talking about the way this jealousy takes place. It's a, it's a male thing that has to be fixed by men. And so, um, and so in a sense, you could say that these historical developments came because, well, we can't fix men very easily, uh, but let's work with the women because <laughs> maybe that will help. So, uh, but, but we should go back to the root and say, hey, we men, let's fix ourselves up. So Ibn Arabi has the other concept. Someone says, this and this happened. Didn't you see that? Or this, didn't you see that woman like this? And Ibn Arabi has, tells the story, he says, well, I wasn't looking. <laughs> So you're the one who saw her, and so you're the one who's in trouble. Yeah, because you're the one who saw her. I don't talk about what she was up to. I talk about what you were up to, looking at what you should not look at. <laughs> and also for the Hassad, I think it becomes like a Malami way. Nazar bar Qadam means keep your gaze at your own feet, means keep the gaze on yourself. And I think that, that, that stops a lot of jealousy, because keeping up oneself is, first of all, oneness, then it's going inside rather than because looking at others doing comparison and then comparison is cause of their jealousy you know that's, that's so true and the, and the whole idea ibn abi has a beautiful passage on privacy which we probably should look at because this generation has forgotten what privacy is but ibn abi just says so the first rule is mind your own business <laughs> there it is <laughs> thank you thank you Yeah, so from, from, the, from the chats uh, to talk about the Mahdi at some point and end times, uh, we may look at that at some point. Uh, but um, <clears throat> what we did a few weeks ago with the es eschatological view is actually that we should worry about the end of the world when everyone is doing just fine and no one's hungry and no one's thirsty and, and all the men are cured <laughs> and then everything is looking really good and we don't have to pray to God anymore. That's when the end times will come. So it's a little bit opposite of what we think. So when things are falling apart and men just can't behave and on and on and on, that tells us that we're probably right in the middle times because we're still asking God for help all the time. <laughs> Um, and I think we looked at Uzair's idea of the hijab, and then and then Andreas the hijab, the the very the, the spiritual hijabs that come afterwards, and the body hijab. We'll look at that. So, okay, um, okay. I think we have time for one last. Uh, Alex 
H has a raised hand, but don't get no ask for any fatwas here. <laughs> or I'll just tell you, take a fatwa from your heart and leave it at that. Uh, take it. Professor Shoaib, I, I think I already used my allocational question earlier on, but thank you for uh, giving me permission for another question. You know, this conversation was very helpful. Uh, this issue of hijab for the past five, six years uh, has been in my mind uh, and I don't understand the, the idea of covering the hair other than Salat. Uh, so uh, that was very helpful. And one other thing that came up while listening to this conversation in the past few minutes is uh, an incident happened to me in the Istanbul Derga. One day, we were, few of us were gathered for casual gathering on a weekend and uh, I showed respect and put my taka on my head but the sheikh was not. And one of the senior dervishes pulled me aside and said, when the sheikh or sheikha is not covering the hair, we don't cover. When the sheikh or sheikha is covering, we cover. I immediately took it off and put it in my pocket. So, uh, you know, one of the benefits of being in a community, uh, spiritual or religious community that, that I've noticed is that the leaders take certain responsibility that's given to them from above and the followers have some relief pertaining those responsibilities. So I don't know what Ibn Arabi's position is on, position is on this issue. Just follow the leader that you have committed to with this issue of covering the hair or for example, not exactly, you know, minute by minute, but in general, their behavior in the market, their behavior in the, in the dargah, their behavior while praying, if you want to follow exactly, you know, minute by minute, fine. But in general, see their behavior, you know, uh, in, in a party, in a wedding, wherever. Uh, what's Ibn Arabi's position in following your, your, your sheikh, your sheikha, your imam, yeah, well, the way Ibn Arabi looks at that is the idea of emulation, that uh, as human, human animals, we learn by emulation, and so that by following, by doing what someone else is doing. And in fact, that's how the salat, the prayer, was taught by pray as you see me praying. So pray as you see me praying is the basis of the instruction for salat. So it's follow the way I am doing it the Prophet ﷺ. And so that's why uh, the only time the Imam can be on an elevated surface is when the Imam is teaching the rest how to do something, how to pray. So this is a general, uh, our nature is that we learn by following. And so primarily we learn by following, maybe secondarily we learn intellectually. So the Prophet ﷺ didn't give us an intellectual list of how to pray. He said, pray as you see me praying. And so for Ibn Arabi, this, this emulation is also I used, I think, you, the word relief. It is a relief because what, by having people that we emulate, this is how we are, we, are, we are taught what we need to do. And then we find a relief in saying, I'm seeing someone else do this, and that's how I can do it. And so having people who are of these elevated uh, states, have them around us and to be looking at them is, a, is a, a relief for us. And that's why one reason we have such love for the people that we are the following, for the sheikahs. And so uh, that, and then, and then we saw that slide about the, the Arafim, the, the, the mystics. The first thing they do when they leave their mother's womb, they look back at her. So they emulate their mother. And so we emulate our mother, we emulate Mother Earth, and we have love for Mother, love for Mother Earth, because they are the teachers. And so we learn this not intellectually, but pray as you see me pray. I think, uh, Hassan, yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, hey, uh, uh, Shoaib, thank you very much. Uh, wonderful talk, and I learned a lot. I do have one question uh, regarding the uh, maybe makeup of ladies, women, and even men. In Ibn Arabi, in Futuat, he uses uh, this hadith a lot. He says, Wallahu Jamil Yuhibbu Jama. God is beautiful and uh, he loves beauty. And also, he mentions about the reality of a thing. 
He says the face of a thing is the uh, reality of that thing. Now, based on this, uh, I, I don't know. I think maybe, maybe his job is not apart from the prayer, as you said, to make somebody humble. Maybe it's not necessary. Or uh, what do you think of the makeup of a uh, woman? Because they, they make him more beautiful. Well, on, that, that, that would be a good ijtihad. Yeah, Ibn Arabi, I don't think, has anything to say about, well, he, he talks about the coal-lined eyes, mm -hmm. but he, I think he's, the coal-lined eyes are the, are, the, are the people, they can be the boys also, the men, so, mm -hmm. so um, and that's, and then, yeah, he says, he has a poem where the coal-lined eyes are, are, are dripping, so the black is going all on the cheeks, because the person is so in love of God, that he's just falling apart, and so his coal-lined eyes begin to drip, so that's the most I think about mascara that we've heard from Ibn Arabi. But uh, yeah, the, but this is, see, the, those are, that's what ijtihad is for. It's to be able to look deeply inside what are the roots and what are my motivations. And so, and what Ibn Arabi is doing with this whole thing about hijab is ask the motivations, saying that, oh, God should have made this rule. You know, what's my motive for, for feeling that way? Alhamdulillah. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Well, thank um, you for being here. Okay, Omar has one last question, I think, and then. I think just one, one last thought that comes to me because we've been speaking a lot specifically about the hijab, but to me, the wider subject of the branches as opposing the roots, uh, you know, at the same time, I, the way I feel is that we should not undermine the validity of the branches once somebody established them because they are the cultural flowering of a certain understanding. So while, you know, I say I go back to the root and I see that this branch does not apply to me, we should be very wary of devalidating the branch per se, you know, because, because the branch is valid. The choice of the hijab for those who made it knowingly is valid. You know, it's the fact that I, you know, it might not be a root does not mean that that whoever have chosen it as a, as, as, as a branch is to be questioned. And I think, I feel that this is, this should be said. Yeah, yeah, and that's why Ibn Arabi says, the, the people, the family of God, they look at the rule of whether it's beginning rule or a, or, a, or a rule that came not in the beginning, but they take both of them. They take both of them with an open heart. And the more they investigate, the more their heart is relieved and restful by taking that so it's recognizing th that there is a culture this this there is a there is an islamic culture as it were um, and it's and so uh and so even though the message is universal the, it does have a cultural form a cultural vessel but what ibn arabi is also telling us though is that there that you can't if if we have the if we keep our root branch the the asal and the furu if we keep those together we're in good shape but if sometime we have a branch and the root has disintegrated we can't see the root anymore we just have a branch here so we're holding on to this branch without our root so we always have to have the branch with the root saying oh i'm covering because this is something that was called for you know 1400 years ago uh, and the root is this but if i'm in a situation where the root is no longer you know, feeding this branch, then, then there's a difficulty. So we honor the branch when it is being nourished by the root. And in effect, a, a societal disintegration is when we have a bunch of branches and no roots. So that's, and, and so that's something personally to look at. Have I, have I taken this because of the root and the branch? Or have I taken it because the branch happens to suit me or doesn't suit me? There, how do you know? And Aisha uh, Safda, I think, has a question, a raised hand. Yeah, sorry, I just, just following on from that, I know time is getting late. Mm -hmm. um, just thinking about the branch and the roots and the hijab, um, I think if we think about identity and identifying, that's quite a root. And I think in this current climate where we are so dispersed, we're not living in Muslim mm -hmm. communities, mm -hmm. um, recognizing another sister, recognizing another brother, Mm -hmm. So identity for me is something really important that I can walk the streets. I know if it's another Muslim sister, mm -hmm. say salam to her, she says salam to me. And it's about the identity and identifying, which you could argue is possibly original 
root or branch or what have you in the hijab says that purpose possibly no that that's beautiful i, I mean just personally that's the w whenever i walk through the kuala lumpur airport and you see all the people vacationing from gulf countries and all the men are in their shorts and their awful t-shirts and they're just like oh my god and then the women are all completely bailed and everything and i say how come she has to cut carry the culture but you can just look like a who knows what you know so so certainly there, this idea of carrying culture and then it is something that is beautiful to be able to say I'm, I'm presenting as someone who is a Muslim and then be, oh, assalamu alaikum. And it's such a beautiful thing to be in this country, for instance, and to be able to say salam to someone. And then they look back and say, oh, gosh, we're, you know, I'm not the only one here. So, so, there, so that, again, that tells you that uh, to, to see this and, and you're not looking at it, oh, I'm covering my awrat, I'm covering my private part. You know, it's, it's to see this as I'm identifying as a cultural identification so that other people in this community can see us. So that becomes that becomes very very important, very important. and and then and then if that identification becomes dangerous, then the situation changes again. So mm. I like but your point see about how, see how personal all that becomes. Yeah. Yeah, but the, the the point of the men wearing whatever they want to wear, I think there is a strong focus on women and how they look and how they appear, questions of makeup mm -hmm. and job and things. And I think your key point was. Um, don't mean to be rude or anything but you know the sick men need to be addressed and uh, the focus on the women maybe needs to be balanced with focus on the men yes yes thank you thank you Aisha. yeah okay well thanks very much for being here it's, I, I you know think about this often and i think uh, thinking about well, how will people think about this? What will they, what will they receive? And so, alhamdulillah, it's so good to have have everyone here and such beautiful comments and questions. Thank you.